Hello and welcome to episode four of the Don't Change Much podcast. This one is titled, Mental Health is a Team Game. So who better to talk to than the coach of one of Canada's hottest teams right now, John Herdman, the head coach of Canada Soccer's men's national team. Now don't forget the Don't Change Much podcast is made possible by a generous lead gift from the Jack and Darlene Poole Foundation. John Herdman will speak with me today about his earliest experiences with mental health issues, the stress it caused his family, and the difficult lessons he was almost forced to learn about awareness and the power of the mind. We'll discuss why the pandemic proved to be the most difficult period of his coaching career. Preparing for opponents proved somewhat easier than trying to prepare for COVID. John had to lean into exercise and proper nutrition to help combat sleep debt and anxiety of fearing for the safety of his players. John's direct approach to conversation about mental health offer a powerful example of how acknowledging vulnerability, asking for help, and identifying personal challenges can affect positive change. Manage your stress, not the other way around. For simple ways to improve your mental health, check out the free MindFit Toolkit from the Canadian Men's Health Foundation. Complete a self-assessment, access virtual counseling, and learn more about how anxiety, stress, or depression might be impacting your health. Go to menshealthfoundation.ca and access the MindFit Toolkit to start improving your mental wellness today. Well, John, thanks so much for taking the time out of your busy schedule to join us on the Don't Change Much podcast. Before we get to some of the more serious subject matter, you've been a very popular man in this country for more than a decade now. The first uh, coach to lead the women's and men's program to the World Cup. You know, of course, uh, Olympic success with the women's program. Coaches are always looking forward and you're probably looking towards November. But have you had a chance to reflect on just what you've accomplished here, especially recently? Yeah, I had a little bit of time off post the Panama game and the draw, which I think was April 1st. And it's the first first time off I've taken in, oh, it'll be two years, even through COVID. We, we were going through this sort of hamster's wheel of getting ready to get ready, but nothing really materialised. And so we, we were on sort of tenderhooks the whole COVID period, expecting to be called into action as the game was due to restart back up, but then cancelled and cancelled. So yeah, to reflect, it was just a hell of a a hell of a journey. Toughest period through my career, without a doubt. This is the hardest, most difficult job and task that I, that I've ever undertaken. But I always at the end of it, the most rewarding. Yeah, well, definitely. I mean, the country is so excited about what's to come. And you just mentioned the the hamster wheel. I think you admitted not too long ago, last summer perhaps, that you experienced anxiety during the pandemic. Can you perhaps tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah. I think everyone was experiencing different aspects of anxiety from the cabin fever of the lockdown to the uncertainty. And, you know, I've done a little bit of work in and around the brain. It's the one thing the brain really struggles with is that day-to-day uncertainty. And the emotional parts of of the brain are typically lit up and people are put in those emotional states. And when you're in those states for for periods of time, it it can be really unhelpful with with your outlook and the impact it can have on on your energy levels, your, 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 your motivation. I think I was fortunate my anxiety was coming more from not necessarily the lockdown because I was I was finding all the silver linings in the lockdown the time I was able to spend with my kids it was just this constant being ready to get ready to go and it getting cancelled and and everything was on the line for Canada at that time like one game loss in any of the games in in the lead up to qualifying for the octagon would mean we would miss the World Cup. In my world, it was life and death, preparing, looking at all the realities of preparing to compete in a COVID world and the stress of that, and then the anxiety of 
if we lose this game against this opponent, the World Cup dream's over. And then you've got COVID on top of that. So it was, while we were looking for silver linings, there's no doubt there was a a high level of of anxiety. And yeah, I learned a little bit about myself uh, in that period of time. So the anxiety was it was twofold. It was one to do with the job and the and the pressures that I think you felt in some ways before, but also the pandemic and and the fear of keeping you know your guys safe in some pretty you know extreme environments. Yeah, I mean anxiety of the dream going up in smoke for everyone in Canada mm-hmm. that wants to see the team compete at a World Cup. I mean that as a leader you tend to feel the weight of the nation in that sense. And then it was the anxiety of going into a COVID world and at a time, you know, the research, the understanding on vaccinations, all of these things were new. It was, again, that uncertainty um, that, that creates the emotionality around discussions, decisions. But at the end of the day, you were making those final decisions on whether, you know, we were going to travel, whether we were going to create uh, rules around vaccination, whether we were going to put ourselves in dangerous situations at the time. And and then on top of that, you have your family, other people's families asking the hard questions of why is sport really that important at this time? And and then you're in a dichotomy between trying to be a trailblazer through COVID, which was the positive dog I was feeding and then the negative dog of are you going to be the victim of COVID one of the first who made the silly decision of taking an athlete into the USA who got critically ill and potentially even died on your watch I mean these were the decisions you were carrying or already at a time and <laughs> that, that was a, a vulnerable period I think for for most people and, and as a coach I, I know that a big part of your job is leaving no stone unturned you have to prepare uh, so do you think a, a lack of control in some of these situations or a lack of certainty was, was had something to do with it? Yeah, that, I think that's always the root of when you see those emotional responses and emotional behaviors, you, you'll, you know, a lot of that comes down to uncertainty. You know, that the brain will always crave certainty. It will crave structure when it doesn't have that. And particularly you add safety <laughs> to that uncertainty. We're not talking about just uncertain about Am I going in the right direction here to get to a destination? The uncertainty is this genuine safety. And if there's two things the brain were was put inside of our heads to do, it was to keep us safe. And, you know, secondly, to to organize us in a way that moves us forward. Any of your players come to you with any concerns? Absolutely. I mean, we, we had major concerns. You know, we had we had guys traveling across multiple airports. Um, at, at a really difficult time, you know, where the, the infection was at times that was peaking, particularly over the Christmas period when we actually became that first team that went out into the COVID world to compete. You know, players, their, their wives, their, their families were, were telling them not to travel. And we were trying to show them some of the evidence and the science and the safety and the the processes we put in place to mitigate the risks, but the risks were still there. So, you know, I said this at the end, you know, people won't ever really understand what happened here to get Canada to a World Cup. It was uh, one hell of a journey. I mean, you think about going into a place like Haiti. I mean, as a coach, I'm arguing on a telephone, you know, to organize Medivax, which cost about $300,000 to ensure that my my staff and players were safe. And you've got people on the other side of that phone saying, yeah, well, the odds of that happening. So do we need to take that risk in the expenditure? And it's like, oh my goodness, you're obviously not in the eye of this storm where you have got players, their family members, loved ones who, who are asking the question, if you get COVID in Haiti, how are you getting out? And if you get really sick, Who's looking after you? <laughs> I mean, these are the things that, you know, you're dealing with that aren't really in the coaching manuals, but at least I understand now how, to, number one, keep a group safe in Haiti from infectious diseases, as well as how we get people out. I mean, I've, I can put that on my on my coaching resume as, as an added skill during this period.
Well, you were trying to, you know, make sure your players were safe and take care of your players. Were you able to take care of yourself in any way? Do you have someone to lean on to talk about some of your feelings and your anxiety? Not really. And again, I mean, I think uh, Cody Royal, he does a great job in the in the tough stuff. It's a book that was written that really, I think, opens that unwritten gospel on coaching, which is coaches don't get looked after. <laughs> They're looking after everyone else. And you've got to pray, you've got a good wife or a family network of people that genuinely care care about you. You know, and I'm fortunate that my my wife, my kids are very caring people. So they, they would ask the questions. But yeah, I think they've seen, particularly my wife, she'll have seen us go through through hell in this period of time. Yeah, it was difficult. Once your sleep's getting affected, you're on a negative spiral. You should really be getting in into specialist help. But, you know, from my side, you just didn't have the time to get into that level of specialist help because you were on a timeline. You're you're on a timeline to to be at an event somewhere and everyone was relying on you. So I would say, no, you know, you put it down to, okay, I'm developing a thicker skin. I'm developing resilience. But at the same time, you know that you're in a hyper uh, stress state and you're, you're trying to make decisions like critical decisions in that hyper stress state yeah well i mean obviously in sports or in life when there's challenges a lot of times the best way to deal with them is to take them head on but this wasn't something you could blindly walk into so how did you ultimately deal with the anxiety of your situation was just to make you were just make sure you're as prepared as possible and have as much information as possible and then just go forward well i think i think it's avoiding the traps the traps is to navigate these anxieties through things like alcohol masking agents yeah i mean i think that's that's the easy so i had to be very conscious of the state i was in and the state that my staff were in particularly my staff they they were all showing signs of high anxiety some had reported depression and i could see some of the behaviors had been shifting through through the whole covid period you know our salaries had been dropped significantly you had these new added pressures that you'd never experienced as a leader. So for me, it was coming back to the fundamentals, the exercise, and and being very deliberate around ensuring that routine or those high-performing routines. And you, in the job I'm in, I understand the benefits of exercise and how it can impact the men, the mental state. It can create those biochemicals that will support effective performance and and almost become an antidote to anxiety. So for me, I leaned into the exercise component and managed the nutritional element as best I could because that it's the only way I could manage through, I guess, the, the lack of sleep or the extreme workload or the anxiety around the workload as things were changing from day to day, week to week. And then keeping the processes, and I think I said this to people through COVID, I mean, number one, my job was with the staff to bring the staff together as often as we could in formal settings where we were having the social connection. Um, so creating the virtual opportunities to connect with people. And then same time, you know, creating the silver linings. So trying to shift the mentality towards future focus, not the past, not the the here and now, but the opportunities that were sitting right in front of us to really stimulate a different thought process that would stimulate different feelings. So that, you know, that they were the the core elements, I think, to drive myself through. And if I was thinking like that, to prepare seminars, webinars with my staff workshops, then they would think like that because we're provoking those thought processes and patterns that would lead to, I would say, a more positive outlook and positive behavior. But by going through that process, it helped me stay on top of uh, what could easily have been a negative spiral. So even without someone to talk to, you realized quite early that that structure of making sure you exercised every day, making sure you had the proper diet and you followed these guidelines that ultimately that would help you keep your brain right. Yeah, and I think the structure is critical. I mean, I've I've always had that structure. You you can't live 
in the fast lane in the world that I think we live in as high performing coaches, you can't live without level of a high performing lifestyle. There are times you can drop out of the fast lane into a slower lane and and live a bit differently. But to achieve consistent success in your career, you're in that fast lane more often than not. And it's built on the the structures that you've you've created over time. I mean, I've, I've been fortunate to work with some really amazing people that have helped define what that can look like on a daily basis in terms of the structure. So, you, you know, consistently exposing myself to learning. And particularly during the COVID period, I started to work on journaling, uh, more gratitude journaling, specific times on the morning to refocus my mind away from all the bad things that might be happening and all the heavy things to, to, to lighten and brighten early days so you can get your day started. And then the, the usual routines of two exercise blocks and in those one of those exercise blocks, a commitment to learning, which is, you know, have some specific audio books or podcasts that I'm always taking learning opportunities from. So, you know, those those type of structures are important. Having the digital sunsets, you know, my phone going in the top drawer and avoiding, you know, the, the zoning out and the binging on things that just are going to take up important space in my mind when I am should be shutting the mind down. You know, those things were critical parts of COVID, there's no doubt in the routines, but they've been a big part of what's had to become a high performing lifestyle, regardless. Yeah, you've got a great basis of knowledge, I guess, of how the brain works and you're continuing to try to learn about it. So I, I guess it's fair to say that your almost lifelong desire to learn how the brain works really helped you here because you understood how to compete against these anxious feelings. Y- yeah, you are competing against them. I like that. I like that terminology because I feel it's that type of terminology that, that drives people forward, like getting into competition with with the negative aspects of, of life. You know, that's all aspects, knowing that we all have an inherent personalities and those personalities are very persevering. I mean, <laughs> they're difficult to shift and all of us have that shadow that lurks underneath is there ready to sprout up at any time and you're competing with that that shadow those elements of your personality that are are born out of your childhood scripting and periods like covid will try and reveal themselves and and take hold of you so i think for all of us we're we're in competition with you know that negative side of human nature and competing against it is is a great way of of terming that i mean that's that's for me, that's right up my alley to to beat that negative side and beat the depression and beat the anxiety. You know, that's, yeah, yeah, it's a great way to look at it. You said childhood scripting. And so let's just go back a little bit and maybe you could tell the listeners why you first got interested in learning about the brain. Because, you know, from what I read, it didn't really come from a, a positive experience. No, I, I think, I, th- I think um, on the journey, particularly through my coaching in New Zealand, I was exposed to some great influences, but also their coaching journey opened up, you know, young Olympic coaches to try and understand themselves before trying to understand others. It was a real interesting insight as I started to push through my 30s and I, and I could sense, you know, some of my greatest strengths were also greatest weaknesses. This this work, work ethic, which, you know, would push everything else out of my life, this intense focus on getting this thing done was hurting us in other areas, whether it was my relationships with colleagues, with friends, with my family, you know, your 360 degree feedback's pretty interesting when when you become that sort of intense around getting something done and then trying to understand that, unpacking it. It's like they they just a new onion layer sort of unfolded once I took interest in trying to understand me and the more uh, older I've got I'm starting to understand more the way I am the way I am you know what my triggers are why I react certain ways how that's deeply rooted to my childhood and, and I'd have to say you know huge influence who was Dr. Kerry Evans uh, you know Kerry worked with us 
in the preparation for the Olympics 2012. But I've, I've been working with him since 2010, not in a clinical way, more that he was supporting me on my coaching journey and working with teams, but only opened my eyes to, at the end of the day, you know, a healthy mind is, is going to be key to everything. Controlling your attention is the key to everything. Performing under pressure is the key to everything. So I had to understand the, the anatomy of pressure for me and understand what my greatest weaknesses were and where they've come from. And, and he opened the door to some good insights into, you know, growing up, I guess, in a family where you've got two teenage parents who both work, three kids living in council estates in the UK, then, you know, living in an environment where parents divorce young, et cetera, et cetera. There's, there's a lot of things in your external world that have impacted your internal being and understanding how they play out, particularly under pressure and stress, is, has been important for me. You are listening to the Don't Change Much podcast. My name is Dan Murphy. I'm your host and my guest today, John Herdman. Did you, upon these reflections and, and trying to figure out the best version of yourself, how much did you think about some of the problems that, that your father had with mental illness when you were, you know, relatively young? Yeah, and, and I think being a massive fear, I mean, this has been a huge, a huge driver for me in terms of taking myself out of environments or positions or relationships where those triggers are strong. So, you know, my, my father, uh, he went through... Uh, and, and at the time, it was called a mental breakdown. That, that's that's how it was termed when I was around 15 years of age. And the causations of that were deep and, and, and varied. But, you know, at that time in the UK, it was such a stigma to to be diagnosed with any mental illness. I mean, you were regarded as a nutter. Uh, this guy's nuts. He's dangerous. He's, he's this, he's that. And and for me, you had to live with that that stigma. You know, your, your dad is suffering at the time. We didn't know what it was, whether it was schizophrenia, uh, manic depression, bipolar. I mean, all sorts of things were, were being bandied around. All I knew is that I was, you know, living with a father that had lost the ability to control where he put his attention is the simple thing. It's, mm. you know, he, he, he had behaviors that were not normal over time i just came to appreciate that what is normal <laughs> yeah and and then to appreciate it's more of a chemical imbalance that you know is is probably more genetic than anything else and yeah, i still don't fully understand you know what the um the condition is but you know i've got a dad now who i was just with a couple of days ago who's in his late 60s and you know, seems happy in his life, although never fully recovered from from that early diagnosis. But going through it at that time, I mean, I remember being a fifteen year old, sectioning my dad, and that was that was one of the toughest things I've ever had to experience. A sixteen year old, and and then being in some of the institutions at the time and going and seeing what the care looked like. It was it was tough. I mean, that was a tough period of time in my life to, to go through that process. And like I said, the stigma of, you know, someone living in or being re, reconnected into communities and, and society after having time in what was called a mental hospital. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was, it was tough. You must be buoyed. I mean, there's still a stigma and that's what we're always trying to break down. But you must be buoyed now with the, more of an open dialogue more of an awareness because I'm I feel the same way back in the late 80s early 90s I had a friend his name's Mauro Ronaldo he's now one of the world's best combat sports announcers right and he was a teenager just like we were and he would have a bout and it'd be like oh Mauro's gone back to the loony bin and that's just the way you talked right but now the conversation has changed and you there's more understanding I believe in these situations for people that are going through these things because I think there's a more openness to talk about it the narrative's changed. I mean, I feel like you 
I just know, like, my family didn't want us talking about this. It was some time ago I took. I'd mentioned it early in my career uh, in an interview, and I know I took a lot of heat from my family, you know, about speaking out about my dad's mental illness. And although I hadn't really gone into any details, I just realised the pain I'd put them through by just even mentioning it because they felt it was such a private thing. And and then it's like, you know, that's been part of the challenge. Like people have wanted to keep it private because they see it as a black mark or a black stain on your, on your family. And for me, it wasn't that. It was, you know, I, I'm not saying it's something you wanted to celebrate, but you wanted to help people understand he was okay. Mm-hmm. And it's it's not like every person with mental illness is a murderer or a you know potential psychopath in in danger to society which is what I felt was the biggest challenge that anyone that had been into this mental hospital was a threat to society and it just was so far from the truth what I sensed from my dad is he was just had a an over arousal like the brain was constantly stimulated and you know which, which was more of a hyper activity than a than anything that was harmful or worrying, but anyone displaying those sort of behaviours is seen as a threat. So it was more to my feeling on this was, you know, people have got to understand that, yeah, there are probably some psychopaths that (laughs) need to be locked up, but it's probably a 0.01% of people with mental illness that are in that space, but also that these people need help. And part of the understanding is if people aren't aware and they don't understand it, then they're not going to be willing to help or support. And, and they compound the stigma and then compound the, the feeling of the paranoia that often develops in people's minds uh, because of the stigma, which then becomes a downward spiral for anyone with mental illness, that they're dealing with the stigma that develops the paranoia, which then feeds the mental illness. It's, yeah, I mean, I've definitely seen a, a shift in society for some people they're like ah oh, you know why do we bother when they haven't lived with people with mental illness but when you have you recognize the more awareness the better it's going to be for people the theme of the episode right now is mental health is a team game and obviously a team can be family or friends teammates so what's your approach been with your players with the women's program or, or men's when it comes to providing an open space to talk about issues they might be having well, I think the first thing is you have to know this is this is serious. Like we're all different, and there's some things in people's upbringings that have made them more vulnerable, and and it could even be genetics that that have made them more vulnerable to mental illness. I mean, there's there's no doubt that when you are putting ordinary normal people in the conditions that are extraordinary, that's going to have an impact. So. You know, first and foremost, it's about recognizing that our people need support and having people in the environment already there, creating the right environment, safe, trustworthy environments where athletes feel safe to come and perform. That's that's the starting point. So we're not compounding the mental illness that, that could be uh, pre-existing or creating new mental illnesses with people because of the environment we've created. So it's, it's, it's always a proactive approach. So we're not the ambulance at the bottom of the cliff that we call the psychologist in to fix this person. We're crafting an environment that's light, bright, and clear. And those three key words should be taken into family homes, workplaces, light, bright, and clear. And when you think of the opposite to that, what the opposite of light, bright, and clear is, and you can picture those environments in workplaces or family homes, that's where people become vulnerable, I think, to triggering mental illness or, or developing mental illness. So I think there's, there's a proactive starting point with creating the right environment and culture. And then underneath that, you know, the support mechanisms are there. I've always had a well-being, a mental professional in Every environment I've, I've traveled into, whether it's the women's team or the men's team. So people have somebody outside of a coach where they're expecting judgment to occur and that they can talk to and share you know, their, their vulnerabilities. 
So anyone listening to this, I mean, it, it's always a bit of an assessment on recognizing that one. Can you create the environment that avoids the trigger for mental illness uh, or provokes it? And two, can you make sure that your environment recognizes that mental support is no different to having a physical conditioner or a tactical coach? It's a key to our success. In fact, the brain is the most important part. Everything we do as a human being. But as I keep saying to athletes, if I asked you, how many hours have you spent in the gym through your career? Thousands. How many hours have you spent working on your brain? Hundreds, just hundreds, not thousands, maybe a hundred, some of them zero. And, and, you know, whether I'm speaking with corporates or, or my team, I'm always going to come back to we need to invest more in preparing the mind, developing the mind, um, making it more resilient under pressure, um, exposing it to pressure at the right time, etc. There's, there's a lot of work I think needs to be done on accepting that there are people that can really help the mind grow and become more resilient. That's been a message I've carried from dear dot, whether it's because of my experiences with my dad or whether it's what I studied at university or what I've seen firsthand that, um, you know, the, the mindset will always be for me, the, the determinant between reaching a podium or not. You certainly have to treat the brain like a muscle. It needs the workout just like the rest of the body. John, thanks so much for your insight, your knowledge on this subject. And I think it's fair to say that you navigated your anxieties just fine through the pandemic and you got uh, your team where it needed to be and you got your players there safely. So we thank you so much for your time. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. We'd like to thank you so much for listening. And a big thanks to all of you who have already followed us wherever you get your podcasts. If you haven't yet, hit that follow button on your favorite podcast app so you don't miss any of our upcoming guests or episodes. For more helpful tips on improving your mental and physical health, please visit menshealthfoundation.ca and don'tchangemuch.ca. Thanks again.